Hello everyone and thank you so much for joining us to watch our Neurodiverse Sport Athlete vlog. So this week we are joined by Tully Kearney. She's a Paralympic swimmer and she also has autism, although autism has nothing to do with her categorisation as a Paralympic athlete. Um, so it's a really interesting dynamic there um, and she'll talk about that a bit more um, in the interview. And it's also International Women's Day this week, so we'd like to give a shout out to that. Um, but without further ado, over to Tully to tell you her story in her own words. So I was diagnosed with Asperger's when I was nine. I think for me, I always knew that I was a little bit different to other people, but because I also had a physical disability, I wasn't quite sure what it was. Uh, I just knew that I found it hard to communicate what I needed and what I wanted and, and kind of make friendships. And I actually, through all my school years, all my friends were males because they were much simpler and easier to make friends with. There weren't all these social rules that I couldn't understand. Um, with boys, they didn't care. Like if you fell out, they didn't care. They'd forget it and you'd be best friends again the next day. Whereas with girls, it was, I couldn't deal with all these social rules of like having to know how to react and how other people would react. Um, so it, it did affect me quite a lot, but, and I don't know if it's because of my disability, but when I was diagnosed, I kind of was a bit in denial about it. Oh, I, I think again, I was one of those people that had heard like autism or something else, autism is people yeah. with learning difficulties. And, and I was like, well, that isn't me. And that at that point, I didn't know many people like me to compare myself, um, against. And I think that's <laughs> sometimes where the issue is. Yeah that you get compared a lot to other people that obviously autism is a spectrum, but that also have a learning disability and their autism and their learning disability together are quite severe. I'd love to know a bit more about uh, other people's views in sport of autism or what you perceive them to be, because you said that you didn't disclose your autism for a long time. Well, I think for me, when I first made the team, there were quite a few people um, in the S14 category, which is intellectually impaired, that were known to be autistic, but obviously had a learning disability as well. Mm -hmm. And the way that they were treated was pretty bad. Um, obviously, this was a long time ago, and I'm very glad to say it's not the case now. Um, but they, no one took the time to explain and give them what they needed to understand if they were struggling and had I don't like referring to it as a meltdown mm. but because a meltdown kind of sounds like it's a behavioral issue and also is not a behavioral issue yeah but they were struggling to the point where they couldn't function let's say that um they weren't kind at all they were actually really rude and basically told them to grow up um and get on with it and that's not helpful at all mm. and I think part of that is the lack of understanding and knowledge um they were also because of that they were deemed as you know hard to deal with hard to handle so they weren't taken on all the training camps and competitions and they just had a lot less opportunities and I saw that and I didn't want to be part of it <laughs> I was like that is the one thing that I don't want to be a part of um and so I decided that we wouldn't tell anyone and I think any athlete that's been to or been on the long list for a games will know that even on the long list, way, way, way in advance of the games, way before the trials have even happened, you have to disclose all of your medical information from your GP, every single document that has ever been written about you, including obviously diagnosis. So for me, I knew that my autism diagnosis was going to come up because it was in my medical file. Mm. And that was... Um, so my first opportunity was 2012, um, but I dislocated my shoulder and it didn't happen. But obviously this was way before that. So the doctor, I had to trust that the doctor wasn't going to tell anyone. And that was really nerve wracking. Um, obviously I was quite new on a team. I made my first team in 2011. So only a year later for the doctor to find out that I was obviously hiding something. Um, I was really nervous, but luckily no one found out. Mm -hmm. Same thing for Rio. Um, and Again, I had to withdraw, so didn't end up going. But by the time Tokyo came around, a few people did know, so it wasn't as a fear. I, at that point, I didn't want athletes and things to know, but I wasn't as fearful about that. But when you're hiding something that's in medical notes that 
people have access to it is it just makes that anxiety so much worse like oh because if someone finds out in this way this is really bad like it's not going to be a good way for someone to find out like through my medical records or through like the doctor questioning something um as I went on I think I kind of realized like I kind of went from being in denial to realizing how my autistic how my autism actually affects me and that I definitely was autistic um like it it became pretty obvious to me um and obviously the older I got the more I noticed the difference between me and my peers um and the harder it became and especially like I don't like being in massive groups especially with new people um I get quite a lot of social anxiety and it's not just about being in a big group it's like I don't know how people are going to react and respond Mm. and I don't like not knowing because there are a couple of people out there that don't react well to things especially like if you're trying to joke around um and I don't like confrontation (laughs) so I just get very nervous about oh god is this are they going to get upset is there going to be confrontation so I would quite rather pull myself to the side of the room and just speak to one or two maybe three athletes at the time uh, rather than having to interrupt in the whole group so that's obviously affected my relationship with the other athletes and I think because people didn't understand because they didn't know I was autistic I do think sometimes it, I came across as rude yeah. and I didn't like them which obviously wasn't the case but they didn't know that and I really don't think that has helped um over the years and there's just some days where I can't cope with social interaction like I just I'm too anxious or I just don't have enough energy to deal with it especially back then when I was masking it just takes so much energy that I would rather like if we were in the gym stretching before Paul I'd rather sit outside or sit in the like the corner and not speak to anyone it does look really antisocial um and I know there were things like we had like um team building activities but when you swim at a national center when there's less than 10 of you um that's obviously quite difficult Uh, if there's one like especially if there's people that you don't get on with there's one athlete that's been bullying me for quite a few years um and just knows how to wind me up to the point where I can't cope anymore and then obviously I ended up having to go at this athlete and then it looks bad on me and it's just obviously it's frustrating so I'd rather avoid those situations um why are they doing that I think I think they want the team spirit and I think they think that it's the way of getting that but obviously, because they didn't know I was autistic, they didn't realise how detrimental to my mental health that's been. And it has, that was one of the, the biggest things for years. I had so much anxiety. Like sometimes, um, there was one occasion like that they wanted us to go to one of the swimming flats and I just wasn't comfortable, but they kept pushing and pushing and pushing and saying, no, you need to go. I was like, well, I don't feel comfortable going. Um, and I ended up sitting, I got two outside the swimming flats um, and the athletes, um obviously I had to wait for them to get home just walk past me and ignore me and I don't want to be there anyway so I literally was sat in a really bad like rainstorm typical Manchester like checking it down like literally just really anxious and crying just sat in the street like for hours um and I was just that was kind of one of the turning points it's like I can't be doing that again um and I kind of came a bit more stern then that if someone's like oh you need to go and do this for social interaction I was like no but it's one of those where it's, you're worried like when it's when you swim especially when you swim at a national center your coach is a gb coach all the support staff are gb so they know what you're doing and if you refuse to do something it's always that worry luckily it doesn't happen now but like previously if you didn't want to do something they'd be like oh well you know we can take your funding off you Mm. um but because that's happened previously i know it wouldn't happen now it's always in my head yeah absolutely forgotten so it's all i always felt pressured like oh well um that will mean like I'm not adhering to the, the rules of raw and I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. And, and it made me like super, super anxious to the point where that coupled with other things like my mental health was just really, really bad. And I didn't really know how to get through it. Um, I, because of some of my other medical conditions, I had to isolate, which for me, it was actually kind of a blessing in disguise. Like, I didn't have to socialise with anyone. And I loved it. And I had the same thing. <laughs> I got all my PBs after lockdown. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the big eye-openers for me is that before our IAP, um, 
meetings to set our individual athlete goals like every year every season would happen like three or four times a season but because I'm in a national center environment and a lot of the staff back then were based in Manchester we had to go to the office to do it and sit in a room with like 10 people doing it over lockdown it was on zoom and I found it my anxiety was so much less on zoom because if it gets too much you can just close the computer and say like I need a five minute break and come back when you're sat at a table with 10 people sometimes even more it is just so daunting and you kind of feel like everyone's ju- judging and like staring at you and you're just like oh yeah whereas like that that was one of the biggest things is like actually I much prefer to do meetings on zoom yeah um it just really helps me yeah it's such a simple um, thing isn't it like yeah. and I guess it then gives you more energy to it's not like you don't want to be social ever mm-hmm. because there are contexts in sport where you want to be social and you need to be social um to do the sport but i guess it's like everybody recovers in different ways and like lives and thrives in different ways so you know for you it might look like being social for the sport and then making sure you get your downtime to decompress somewhere else where it's quiet um and there's not so much sensory input and actually that would make a huge difference. And does it actually detract from the team? I would argue not. Some people would say that you need to be in each other's pockets all the time. Um, <laughs> my opinion is that you don't, but you know, I could be wrong. So we um, also had like Zoom sessions for our gym sessions. So instead of being like in a tiny gym together, obviously it was all, all over Zoom. So the coach was kind of just watching the screens of everyone. And I actually felt that we were interacting more on Zoom than we mm. were when we're right next to each other in the tiny gym. Interesting. So, yeah, I I know some people didn't like it, but I found it way more, mm. way more beneficial. Yeah. And like um, team Zoom core sessions, like I actually loved. I actually trained more in lockdown than I have done in years. And I think part of, obviously I have a lot of issues with my shoulder and training with like coping with training load. And part of that is the anxiety. I just don't yeah. have enough energy left to recover yeah. efficiently between training sessions. And that was like a massive eye opener. And that's kind of when I decided that I wanted my coach and a, like a couple of the sports staff to know about my diagnosis. And I felt like it would actually really help. And like, I've been working with my coach at that point for almost eight years. And I knew that he knew and understood me, but I, thought he might understand me slightly better if he knew why Mm. um and also some other staff and obviously staff that were the ones that were doing the four social interactions like I I wanted that to stop because it was actually really harmful to my mental health and um obviously the it's actually quite interesting because um we had a new coach in Manchester this season and I actually chose to go to one of the social events but it's it's having that choice mm. but not being forced into it because there's some things that like I actually think is really useful and I enjoy doing but there's other things that would be too difficult or I'm struggling too much at that point in time to mm. cope with it so it's not yeah. always that because that was one of the biggest fears is that if I tell them are they then just going to cut me out of every social interaction um because I don't want that it's just sometimes I kind of want the option to pick and choose being able um, to manage yourself like you are the best expert of your brain yeah and you know how much energy you have and you should be trusted to put it into the right places and to prioritize the Mm -hmm. right things Um, so i went to our pl at the time performance lifestyle advisor who um i like i really trusted Um, and was great and her mum had actually worked with um, people who were autistic so she knew like a great amount and we basically went through and planned like how we were going to say it because I was really nervous like obviously I'd kept this a secret for over 10 years like how are they going to react and um, we kind of went through and we said like that this is my diagnosis this is how it positively impacts me as an athlete this is the thing these are the things I struggle with and these are things I want you to change and try and help me with and that actually came across really well. And uh, after that, some of the coaches did like a course, like an education course about autism and how they can help people with autism. And it kind of, it was kind of good. It came at a time where they were trying to get better at helping people with mental health. Like, um, I guess kind of invisible. I don't know if you, I don't want class autism as a disability, but it comes under that 
within sport, it comes under the that protected umbrella characteristic. Room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was kind of good timing that they were already doing, they were already going to do stuff. Um, yeah. And it was quite interesting because, like, my coach was like, he hadn't put it together that I was autistic, but he was like, I knew what you needed and I knew you had all the traits of autism. It just hadn't clicked that you were actually autistic. Um, and some other staff were uh, quite shocked, but they're the staff that I'm not as close with that don't. I think they just thought I was rude to miserable. <laughs> to oh, be that's so sad. Um, and how did they react? Um, they were very quiet for a while. They were like, I think it was just like they were like, I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, um, and they, they don't. Sometimes really they don't know what to do. I feel like no. people don't know what to do, so they're like, mm. right. <laughs> And I think they were also like a bit worried about why I'd set the meeting. So I think part of it was a relief because I think people that know me know that I have a lot of crazy ideas. And sometimes like when I'm like, oh, can I speak to you about an idea? My coach is like, oh God, not again. So I think they were a bit like partly relieved that it wasn't like a ridiculous idea, something stupid that I wanted to do. <laughs> it was like, um, but yeah, I think it was that shock and not really, not really knowing. Not being, also not being equipped as well. Like if people don't have the background knowledge and understanding and maybe some tools in in their toolbox, then it's almost like you've presented them with something and they're like, I don't, like, they don't know what to do. Yeah. And that's why I guess that's what, what I'm doing with neurodiverse sport, because I had a similar situation to you in that um, understanding myself, getting a late diagnosis, understanding myself, and then sharing almost like my communication plan with the coaches had such a hugely positive impact but it continued to be on me to advocate for myself to explain myself to every single person any any new person that came in or out um and it was a bit potluck as to like what their preconception of something like autism was and um and like that's why i think there needs to be a better basis of understanding of neurodiversity in sport. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's neurology, everybody's behavior traits are different. Um, and it's not that you need to like understand every possible combination because that's impossible. Yeah. But it's just understanding that there is difference and how to potentially like how to work with an athlete to understand them. From what you're saying it sounds like things have moved on a lot even since like five or ten years ago oh yeah yeah we we had a big change so um there was quite a lot of change before tokyo and then after tokyo we've had a whole merge we've had a merge and whole restructure so we're now not para swimming we're swimming as a whole so all the aquatic disciplines are able to swim in para swimming diving uh artistic swimming we're all one uh, and water polo as well so do you think that's good at first i hated it because it was a hell of a lot of change and i don't like change i really struggle with change so um obviously like just just over a year ago my coach was made redundant um in the change and not that when you've worked with someone for that long it's really really especially difficult. the coach that you just that's the coach that you just yeah. said knew a lot about you that's yeah. a shame and for for me, especially around racing, I struggle with all of kind of partly because I have a dodgy shoulder and I can't swim as much as I'd like to. I get a bit worried about where I'm at fitness wise, but also it's all the sensory input. It's a lot like going to a massive meet and having all of that noise and the lights and everything. It's it's a lot. And he was the only person that knew exactly what to say to me. So I relied on him heavily. I, I definitely over relied on him. And while he, now he's not there, I really struggle um so that that was a massive change like whenever I would go to him for everything like yeah. literally anything and everything even if it wasn't swim related uh we had a really good relationship so that's that was really really hard for me and he's the one person that's been there throughout like as my dystonia got worse and progressed and I became more disabled he's the one person that had been there throughout it all um as well as the physio but it's quite it's kind of it's difficult to lose that I guess in terms of like the future, mm. I think 
oh, like I like that I like that it's merged yeah it's merged because I don't I don't think it's helpful for anybody's um uh perceptions of like neurodiversity or para athletes disability intellectual impairment that everything that's different is categorized in the same space yeah and then everything that's not different is over here because the subtext to that is that the able-bodied um neurotypical group um are what is right yeah <laughs> that's what you aspire to and everybody else is is different or wrong i wanted to like just touch on something you mentioned earlier which was raw yeah <laughs> do you want to like explain what that is uh so it was something written into the selection policy quite a few years ago and it made me very nervous because obviously I like things to be black and white. I know I like to know exactly what's expected, what's going to happen. And Raw's kind of not that. It's it's basically they came up with different um, values that they wanted us to look up to and basically follow and adhere to. And that's kind of what they thought an elite athlete should look like on the team. And so it's like... Is it responsibility, ownership, respect? I can't remember what the A is. I don't remember all of it. I don't know what the A is, but basically like different values like that. The issue I have is that I understand it. I get it to an extent, but for someone that's autistic, that's not very helpful to not have like a full layout of what it is. There is not a full document explaining exactly what raw is, which is where I struggle. And I kind of get, I get the values. Like they don't, they want you to respect other people. They want you to have ownership and basically be responsible for everything. You've got to make sure you're here on time. You've got the right equipment and, and that your nutrition, your recovery, everything is perfect, which, yeah, I understand that. But to have that written into a selection policy when there isn't a document explaining exactly what is and isn't raw means that someone like me gets very anxious, nervous because I'm like, well, am I adhering to it? Am I not adhering to it? Have I done something wrong? Um, and it's, it's very, very difficult. And when I've asked to see if there is a document, I've been told, well, there isn't one. And I'm like, well, how do I know if I'm adhering it to it or not? And they're like, well, you'll be following the values. It's like, yeah, but like everything, following a value is like a spectrum. Like there's yeah. how far do you go to follow the value? Yeah. Like is doing one thing following the value or is doing 10 things yeah. following the value? And how you interpret that value is different to how somebody else interprets that value. You talk about anxiety a fair bit, mm -hmm. but like, as just as there's this preconception that autism equals intellectual impairment, which it doesn't, mm -hmm. autism, I would argue also yeah. doesn't equate to having anxiety either. Mm -hmm. But if you've had a lot of bad experiences where you've been misunderstood and you've not been able to communicate and people mm -hmm. have misinterpreted your actions, then it's almost like that's what fosters the anxiety. Yeah. And definitely. I think that's another sort of myth to bust. Yeah. Because I think coaches, teammates, sports staff, like you don't want them to hear the word autism and think, difficult, oh, anxiety. anxious, da da da, like, no, an autistic person can be an absolute weapon, <laughs> <laughs> like, if they're put in the right environment. I think for me, my anxiety is from, like, the not knowing how people are going to respond, not knowing how to socially interact with people, and then obviously from trauma and past experience, like, I had a very bad experience the first year I was in Manchester, um with a coach who was very like verbally and emotionally abusive and I have PTSD from that which means that my trust anyone to do with the national governing body I very I, it's gotten better over the years but I struggle with I struggle mm. with trust I struggle with anxiety um I sh struggle a lot with communicating getting across what I need and that is obviously massively heightened from my autism it's that's not how I ever was before 
um but from these past trauma events it affects me a lot a lot more now than it than it ever did mm. yeah. but I think for me social anxiety is something I've always struggled with because it's the fear of the unknown yeah it's like how for me it's always been like the fear of how to communicate and yeah. how to respond and I decided because of the PTSD and the trauma and everything that's happened to me um over the summer because of an injury I actually ended up spending three months in Loughborough and when I was there I realized how much easier my life is how much like I have so much less anxiety I have more energy to recover and train I was able to do a lot more training um and especially like the the atmosphere at Loughborough Uni is just so nice that no one cared no one cared that I was different and needed different things and and I've decided to relocate there and I knew that I wanted to start on like the right foot I didn't want to move and have athletes not understanding me so I knew that it was it was the right time it was the right decision and I knew that I would be supported by the other swimmers and obviously by by the support staff and I just felt that like not having to hide it would just be such a great fresh start and and it has really helped but again I've had comments from people like, oh it must be so great not to have to mask and it's like you don't just flip it off like a switch yeah not like suddenly oh I'm I'm back to being me from like me 10 years ago after yeah. like hiding yeah. it this long like that's not how it happens but I do feel like slowly but surely I am coming more out of my shell yeah and I totally like get that I'm I feel like I'm in the same place as you as well and you know what actually I went to Loughborough the other day um love for university and I got exactly the same vibe as you I was like this is so great here and it really shows like your experience of moving and um being genuine being open and being accepted by other people to me like one of the things that I have picked up on saying um is that it's environments that are disabling not conditions because for me Although some people feel disabled by their conditions, I, I genuinely think that if they were in the right environment for them, they wouldn't feel disabled. So for me, like... I, I totally agree with that. It's yeah. going to sound weird to other people, but I, I'm a full-time wheelchair user. I don't feel disabled if I'm out and about unless I try and get somewhere, then there's no step-free access. And then I feel like I'm disabled by the environment because I can't access it, not because I'm in a wheelchair, but because there's a step. Yeah. What do you think your neurodivergent strengths are? Like, what does your autism give you that makes you a good athlete? I think one of the things for me is that I, obviously from the years of watching on and learning social behaviours and masking, I have obviously seen a lot of, a lot of things. Um, so I pay, I pay like a lot of attention to detail to everything. And I think part of that is just from the autism, just watching people to to learn how to socially interact. Um, but because of that, I'm very good at problem solving. I'm very good at, I have quite a wide knowledge of how to get around things and um, how to come up with things. I've got quite an engineering brain, so I've got an issue and I can't overcome it, whether it's an access issue or like a piece of equipment that doesn't quite work for me. I'm very good at um, knowing how to fix it. And just coming up with solutions mm. um and i do think that how much time i spent growing up watching other people and observing really helped me with that um i'm also like i think a lot of autistic people refer to themselves as kind of black or white like i'm not i'm not a slacker i'm not one of those people that will just have a goggle break like pretend their goggles are broken and just like slack that's not me uh if anything i actually i always want to do more my coaches always have to have a go at me and tell me off and like give me my limits but I'm extremely like extremely extremely hard working and like once I've got a goal I don't want to let myself down I don't want to let anyone else down so once I've got a goal I'm gonna do everything I can in my power to to get there and I'm like pretty stubborn with that and I do think my autism has actually helped me with that because I don't like change I don't like like if I set something mm. I don't want something else to happen <laughs> so it's like if I said it I mean business and um I think as well, like, even though I do struggle in social situations, because I don't like conflict, I don't like, like, I don't like when people tell tales and tell stories and like bitch about other people. So 
I am very loyal. Like once I'm your friend, that's it. I'm not going to go behind your back like that. And if you go behind mine, that's like, I guess one of the downfalls is that that's it. The trust is broken forever. But I do think like that is one of my strengths is that I I prefer to have a few friends rather than loads, but be really close to them. Mm. People assume that people with autism don't understand what other people need, don't think about them, and they're not very kind or caring. And that's definitely a myth that isn't. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, And for me, kind of sometimes to my downfall is that I'm always thinking about other people. Yeah. So I kind of go, uh, sometimes go above and beyond to do little things. And because I'm so, I observe so many things, like I'll remember things and I'll surprise someone, like um, I'll randomly turn up with someone's favourite cake or like make them a T-shirt with their cat on or like something like, just some something little that, means a lot to them that they wouldn't that other people wouldn't necessarily think of it's kind of like the little things mm. so like obviously like my work with charities and stuff is that I'm just very determined to to make a change so that other people don't have to go through the similar thing so if there's anything I can do to make anyone else's life a bit easier even sometimes if that means that like I have to struggle for a few weeks to fit everything in then then I'll do it what would you like to see change or move forwards in this space like neurodiversity and sport I think one of the things is that obviously it, we've spoke about how it's a spectrum like people are different um and obviously to try and break down the stigmas but I have had some people especially since I posted like on social media be like oh well I know one autistic person like that just because you know one autistic person doesn't mean you know all of us um so I I think Obviously, it's great to get that awareness out there, but I still want coaches to be pushed to learn about their individual athlete because knowing something generally about autism, I mean, yeah, it will help to an extent. Everyone is different. Everyone faces different challenges. So if they can actually learn about their own individual athlete and exactly what they need, that will be the best way to get the best out of their athlete and also protect their mental health going forward. And it doesn't just help autistic or neurodivergent people in general. It helps everyone. Yeah. Because whether you're in this classification of neurotypical, which still is covers like a multitude of different neurology and behavior traits, like every single person is different. And yes, in sport and in team sport, sometimes everybody has to do the same thing. But if coaches can understand each athlete and just make those little tweaks here and there, ultimately everybody's experience and performance will improve. So you no know, neuro inclusion doesn't just help the people who are furthest from the norm. It helps everyone. Yeah. So it's something that's worth investing in. I know it's, it's quite hard for yourself to think about the best way for someone. To, I don't know if it's just an, an autism thing, it was just me, but I find it really hard to actually think about, oh, well, how would I want someone to go about it? Um, obviously, the obvious things, like I don't want someone to shout at me, but it's like those little things that I struggle with thinking of. But it would be like, you know, if, if the coach has got a neurodiverse person that potentially has social anxiety, it could be useful for them to write certain things like of how they respond and how they would like to be approached and the best way like is it better to phone them is it better to text them and then like kind of match their pages together and see what works best for both both of them that's such a great idea I love that um that's your practical problem solving there (laughs) if people wanted to contact you would you be happy with that if they wanted to contact you to get any advice or yeah I don't know maybe Um, just pay your compliment (laughs) <laughs> yeah happy for people to contact me uh on instagram that's probably the thing i look at most just just for people to be aware there are sometimes like, if i don't respond i'm not ignoring you but maybe if i don't respond in a month send me another message because sometimes i get overwhelmed with requests and i don't see them all yeah for now it's been like really great to talk to you and your cat where is he <laughs> there he is what a chonker Yeah, thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you.